in other settings, I have commented that one in three of us will be diagnosed with cancer in our lifetimes. One in three is a big number. So look to your left and look to your right. <laughs> if it's not you, it will be the person on your left or on your right. And if it's not you or your neighbor, it will be a brother or sister, or it will be a parent or child. Cancer is an insidious disease. It robs patients of their appetite, their energy, their strength, their stamina. It robs them of their independence and, in many cases, their happiness. It's an unfair disease, and it is no respecter of persons. So one in three is a big enough number that we ought to just plan on it. In fact, better yet, let's start thinking about how we can help our friends, families, and neighbors when that diagnosis comes. What can we do? What will we do to help them? How can we help ourselves? Well, I think a clue comes from our furry mammalian friend, the house mouse. And you may be wondering, what in the world does the house mouse have to do with how we're going to attack cancer? Well, it turns out that we share about 95% of our DNA in common with mice. That's another big number, 95%. I think there's a couple of things to learn there. The first is, apparently, it doesn't take much additional DNA to learn speech or how to walk uprightly. <laughs> More importantly, and, and, and maybe more seriously, it means there's probably something that we can learn from mice. And there is. Recently, a scientific publication looked at two groups of mice. Uh, and these mice uh, developed cancer. And in the first group, mice that developed cancer were placed off to the side, alone, by themselves, separate from the rest of mice. In the second group, when a mouse developed cancer, it was placed in a group of mice, and it became the mouse in the middle of that group. Would you like to guess which mice lived longer and were stronger and did better? Yeah, absolutely. It was the mouse in the middle. It was the mouse that was left in the group. Those mice lived longer and were stronger and did better. When mice are engaged and have social interaction, they do a lot better. And we, who are 95% identical to mice, are no different. So that's our first clue in, in asking what can we do when that diagnosis comes. Well, let's make our friends, family, and neighbors the mouse in the middle. Think of the power of that statement, the mouse in the middle. Let's surround them with the social network that they need. Let's empower them. Let's lift them up and strengthen them. If sick, place the mouse in the middle. If sick, place the friend, family member, or neighbor in the middle. I've seen this in action. One of the great joys of my life is the precious opportunity I have to take care of cancer patients. I love it. I get to meet people when they become the one in three. Sometimes we have an opportunity to cure, and that can be exhilarating. And sometimes we don't have the opportunity to cure, and that's really hard. I spend time counseling and hugging and laughing and grieving, and I love all of that. I've learned that um, there's a lot that happens uh, during that time. I've learned that the relationship between a cancer patient and their doctor is like nothing else in medicine, and I think maybe like nothing else in life. So it is through that lens that I have watched patients. I have seen those who are the mouse in the middle. I get to sit on the other side of that exam room door in the clinic, and I see patient after patient come in, and it's amazing. Those who are the mouse in the middle, it's easy to spot. They come and they're always accompanied by someone, and usually it's the same person at every single visit. It's a spouse or a devoted child, it's a parent or a sibling or a neighbor, and often they come in groups. And, and when they come, they, they look like they're coming for a day-long event. They come carrying bags and magazines and drinks and treats and snacks, and they've got their iPads and they're ready to go, and they're wearing matching t-shirts and they've got wristbands and headbands, and, and it's inspiring. Uh, the point is, they come in support. They come with their arms around that person, ready to support them. And those who come in support are there to help listen to the plan. They're there to help think through what's happening. They're there to share in the good news. And they're there for the bad news. They're there to help think through decisions. And sometimes they're there to help lighten the mood when that's needed. In contrast, I have seen patients come who are not the mouse in the middle, and they have little or no support. And that's tough. 
that strength in numbers is missing. That mouse in the middle phenomenon is absent, and it's really apparent. Now, if you or someone you know is that person that doesn't have support or for whatever reason has not wanted to allow that support into your lives, I invite you to reach out and find a friend. We live in a world that, where it's increasingly easy to become isolated. We interact through social media and on digital devices. We can have a thousand friends at our fingertips, but we need one who will physically hold our hand. We can have hundreds of friends online, but whom would we call if we needed a bowl of soup? So I invite you to reach out and find that friend. I am certain that there are people waiting for the opportunity to experience this with you. I know that there is a friend waiting for the privilege of standing shoulder to shoulder with you. When you become the mouse in the middle, you, you harness the power of an amazing social network. Now, the next step after that, after we have embedded ourselves and surrounded ourselves with community, friends, family, and become this mouse in the middle, is that we want to get in the middle of our medical care as well. There are several recent advances happening in cancer care right now that are absolutely transforming the way we treat patients. It's like nothing we've ever seen. We're at a confluence of science, technology, and medical care that is allowing us to not only surround people, but target that mouse in the middle with precision. And let me just illustrate this point. Five years ago, if someone had been diagnosed with lung cancer, they would expect to have a workup that in, would include CT scans and biopsies and pathology reports and meeting with doctors and nurses. And then ultimately, they would receive chemotherapy and radiation. Well, in many cases, that would work. In some cases, it wouldn't. In the cases where it wouldn't, the options after that become quite limited. Today, however, five years later, there's a much different scenario. That same patient diagnosed with lung cancer would expect to have quite a different workup. Now they would still have the same CT scans and biopsies and meeting with doctors and nurses, but they would also expect to have a really comprehensive genomic analysis. And that's a big word, but it's really cool. They can expect to have DNA pulled from their tumor and looked at to find the specific genes that were changed in their tumor that caused just their tumor to grow in a very individualized way. In addition, they would expect to have a whole protein analysis. So now they have genomic analyses, proteomic analyses, in addition to all of these other things. And this new approach has a name. It's called precision medicine. And precision medicine includes all of these things, as mentioned, the CT scans, health history, medications, and now these new approaches, including looking at your DNA, immunotherapies, and others. This forms an additional ring outside of that social network. Now we have precise medical care in addition to the social support. And the results are, are terrific. That lung cancer patient that I mentioned, diagnosed five years ago, would expect to have a survival measured in months. That's, that's tough to swallow. Today, that same lung cancer patient, if they have certain genes or certain protein changes, they could expect to have a survival measured in years or longer. Pretty terrific changes. And there's more. In addition to these targeted treatments and, and DNA analyses, there are new immune treatments, immune therapies. We actually recently have developed the ability to awaken a patient's own immune system to recognize cancer and attack it as if it were foreign. That, that's pretty cool. My favorite example of this, actually, is a drug uh, that has recently been approved and is available. It's given by IV, and it's an antibody. Because it's an antibody, it's just like the antibodies that our bodies make normally. So it has very few, if any, side effects. And the way it works is that cancer cells, unfortunately, are pretty smart. <laughs> they have figured out how to evade our natural immune systems. And they do this by putting proteins on their surface. So these immune cells have these, uh, excuse me, these cancer cells have these little proteins on their surface. And when an immune cell comes in contact, that protein says, everything here is fine, go away. And that's what happens. And then the tumor is free to grow. When we give these immune therapies or immunotherapies, these antibodies come and stick on those proteins and mask them 
so that now when an immune cell comes in contact, it doesn't get that signal that everything's okay. It actually recognizes the cancer cell as foreign. It attacks it and eliminates it like it's supposed to do. The results can be breathtaking. We're seeing responses that we've never seen before. It's, it's totally exciting. Now, it doesn't work for everyone, and there's lots left to do. The point is precision medicine, immunotherapy, this whole social approach to cancer care is not your father's cancer medicine. This is, this is a new era in every way, and it's totally exciting. Now, the next step after being in the middle of our uh, social network and being surrounded by precision medicine, and remembering that precision medicine really is defined by medicine that is uh, genomic in nature, takes into account our molecular and personal information to inform personalized health treatment plans. That, that's the essence, but it, it really is, is reactive, uh, and, and that's okay. But as we engage that precision medicine and social network, we see something very interesting that happens, which is this target phenomenon. And at the bullseye of that target is the mouse in the middle. In other words, we surround that mouse in the middle, that patient, with all of the social support they need, all of this sophisticated health care, and it's all focused on that single individual. And that's exactly what we want, and that's how we get the best outcomes. The only thing that is better than treating cancer in that way would be to prevent cancer. And that's the next concept, the next layer, which is precision health. Let's go beyond precision medicine, which is reactive, and let's pursue precision health, which is preventative. And precision health is really defined similarly to precision medicine. It's the application of precision medicine principles, these same genomic, molecular, personal health discoveries, but applied now to populations with the, with the goal that we are going to keep people healthy as long as possible. We are going to help patients live the healthiest lives possible. In the past, precision health has meant let's do things like get our cancer screenings. And honestly, that's the best thing that we can do. When, we found, when our friend or neighbor is diagnosed, let's not only surround them with social support, but let's make sure that we ourselves are getting the screenings we need so that we don't have now two people with cancer, right? The only thing worse than having one person that we all have to try to get through this very difficult thing is to have two people or three people. So when we follow Precision Health, we do things like get our mammograms when we're 40 and get colonoscopies when we turn 50 and uh, wear sunscreen. <laughs> and all of these practical approaches, increasingly we are seeing that Precision Health also means getting DNA testing. Imagine if we could draw blood from everyone here tonight, today. And then we could look and see if you inherited genes from your parents that would place you at risk for developing a cancer in your lifetime. It turns out 10% of all human cancers are inherited. They arise because they came from a gene that you got from one of your parents. 10%, that's another big number. So imagine if we could prevent all of those cancers. That's tens of thousands, it's actually hundreds of thousands of cancers a year in this country alone that we could prevent. And that's what's coming, is the opportunity to add to our traditional screenings this layer of molecular and DNA screenings looking for people who have inherited cancers. Well, my, my hope and my belief is, is that precision medicine and precision health, along with surrounding the mouse in the middle with a social network, is the answer to how we treat cancer. I started by talking about the one in three, and one in three of us will be diagnosed with cancer in our lifetime. When that diagnosis comes, it can be overwhelming. Our heads can spin and we can be uncertain of what to do. My hope is that if that happens and when it happens, you'll, you'll remember this philosophy. You'll share what you know with others. You'll place that mouse in the middle of this great network. Make it the bullseye. My hope is that you will make yourselves the mouse in the middle of your own social care, your own precision health care, and your own preventative health care. Thank you.